What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Wrestle Rant, where every single week I, Graham G.S. and Matthews, break down all the pay per views and live specials that I watch on the WWE Network as well as on the Global Wrestling Network. Today, we're talking NXT TakeOver War Games from almost exactly one year ago in November of 2017, ahead of the upcoming installment, NXT TakeOver War Games 2 over Survivor Series Weekend. Um, this was a great show. It really was. It was neck and neck for TakeOver Show of the Year between Brooklyn 3, TakeOver Brooklyn 3, um, in August of that year, and then War Games later on in the year. This was really a late runner for Show of the Year for NXT. Top to bottom, this was a great fucking card. The build was great as per usual with NXT. Every match delivered for the most part. The booking was spot on. And a number of those matches too would be considered front runners for NXT Match of the Year. Plus, the crowd was great all night long in Houston. This was just a really exciting, entertaining event from start to finish. So we'll start it off here with Lars Sullivan versus Cassius Ono. Lars Sullivan had been running rampant on the entire NXT roster for many months. Cassius Ono, I mean, he had really been pigeonholed as the stepping stone for up-and-coming talent in NXT really since he got there. He lost to Bobby Roode. He lost to Hideo Itami, um, who we'll talk about more in a minute, but he lost to Roode. He lost to... Alistair Black, he lost to Johnny Gargano, he lost to a lot of people um, in first coming back to NXT. Then after ending his feud decisively with Hideo Itami, who he beat in a notice qualification match shortly after TakeOver Brooklyn 3, allowing Itami to be promoted to 205 Live, um, Ono then kind of get it, you know, got back on track and started to get on a roll again by winning more matches and building momentum, ultimately leading him to taking on Lars Sullivan, who it was kind of an X factor at this point. No one really knew what he would bring to the table. Um, up to this point, a lot of the matches he had were largely squashes. He took on, I think he faced Roderick Strong after that, but leading up to TakeOver, he had a few matches with Raul Mendoza, Oni Lorcan, Danny Burch. They were all glorified squashes, but every one of those squashes was super exciting to watch. Um, Lars Sullivan is great. I mean, a lot of his matches blend together, but when he's in there with the right guy, the guy can go. I thought the Aleister Black match, you had to take over Chicago earlier this year was great. He had a really good performance in that um, takeover ladder match earlier this year as well. So Sullivan can deliver in big match situations, in my opinion. This was really his first test at, you know, determining and proving whether he is really worth the fans' time. And I think he, he passed that test here with a good showing against Cassius Ono. The match was far from an instant classic. It was only five minutes long, but Sullivan was largely on offense. Ono... Had a good showing in defeat here, too. He battled back, ultimately, to no avail. I thought this was a very hard-hitting, fun five-minute encounter. And both guys, you know, look good coming out of this. Sullivan would go on to chase the NXT Championship at the onset of 2018 and just continue to build momentum. So, again, I thought this was a very good way to kick off the show. The good win for Lars Sullivan, his TakeOver debut on the show as well. After that, one of my favorite matches all year from NXT, between Aleister Black and Velveteen Dream. Now... Talking about the match itself would not do the match justice, just because the build-up was one of the best build-ups for a match I'd seen in NXT in a long-ass time. Now, again, that, that's really saying something, too, because NXT does a great job with all their matches on every takeover. They do a great job of making you care about the match leading up to the event. With Black and Dream, though, it was a different story. Black had been running through fools left and right since arriving in NXT, um, at the onset of 2017, knocking off Andrade San Alamos, Cassius Ono, Hideo Itami, and now he ran into the Velveteen Dream, who had also been on a bit of a roll since arriving in NXT shortly after Black. So he was kind of an X Factor as well, but the entire build of this bout was kind of focused on how Dream wanted Black's respect. Black had yet to utter the words Velveteen Dream, he had yet to even say his name. Dream wanted Black to say his name, say my name, say my name. All this other, you know, all this other shit that went into it. Playing mind games with Black, attacking him before matches on the NXT TV shows leading up to TakeOver. Everything about the build I thought was fucking perfect. And not only was the build up perfect, it was a great feud. It was different than like, oh, I have a problem with you because we both want the NXT Championship. Arg. Like, no, Dream had a legitimate gripe to want to face and beat Black. He wanted to be the one to end Aleister Black's undefeated streak. But even more so than that, he wanted his respect he wanted Black to say the words, or say his name really, Velveteen Dream. And Black, I don't even think he had talked. Maybe he cut a promo or two after this or before this. I don't really remember. I don't remember when the first promo he cut in NXT was. But it was around this time. So anyway, 
Um, they had an awesome match. Dream really rose to the occasion here, which is why I don't think people were really all that excited for this encounter going in, just because Dream was... I mean, he had a number of good matches on NXT TV leading up to this match with Leo Rush, of all people, who he had teamed with on the indies before coming to NXT. He had, you know, a few other good matches with other local talent and up-and-coming talent in NXT, but he had yet to have that one breakout performance, which is, I think, this what match... What this match offered for Dream was a great opportunity for him to showcase his skills in front of a bigger audience, show the world what he was made of, and show that not only is his character great too, because he's a very unique character, has gold dust vibes, of course, um, but not only that, but that the guy can go, flat out go in the ring, which is what he did here. He and Black had awesome chemistry. It was a really exciting match. I believe this was the match where Dream debuted that... Um, crossroads-like maneuver that he still does to this day. I don't know what he calls it, the inverted DDT. It looked fucking awesome here, and Black sold it like he had taken a bullet. That's how great the selling was for that move here by Black. Um, this was really, really fun. I would not argue with anyone if they called this the match of the night. That's how much I enjoyed this match. They weren't given a ton of time. It was only about 15 minutes, which still is a good amount of time, considering the takeovers were only about two, two and a half hours, and it was the second match on the show. It was an undercard outing. Does anyone really expect them to get 20 minutes? No, I mean, they probably should have gotten 10 minutes in theory, but they ended up going past that, having an awesome match that made the most of the time they had, telling a great story, and the in-ring action was exceptional. I thought these guys had amazing chemistry together, like I said earlier. So in the end, Black goes over, emerges victorious in clean fashion, before grabbing a mic and says, I, I forgot exactly what he had said, but he did say the words Velveteen Dream. He said, um... Something along the lines of, like, you have my respect now, Velveteen Dream, or whatever it was, but everything about this match was just fucking perfect. It was absolutely amazing. So, yeah, he did acknowledge Dream afterward by saying his name, and it was just led to a great reaction from the audience who had then really warmed up to Velveteen Dream. Maybe people came into this contest not caring a shit, not giving a shit about Velveteen Dream, but they came away from this match really invested in what he had to offer in the ring, on the mic, as a character, and people were thoroughly, solidly behind him by the end of this match. This was an awesome outing, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, after that, we had a fatal four-way to crown a new NXT Women's Champion. The combatants included Peyton Royce, Kyrie Sane, Nikki Cross, and Ember Moon. Um, so Asuka had relinquished the NXT Women's Championship at um, shortly after TakeOver Brooklyn 3 as a result of being promoted to Raw soon after that. Um, so the NXT Women's Championship was declared vacant, and all these women earned their spot in the matchup, with the exception of, I think, Moon, Cross, and Royce all won, like, qualifying matches of some sort. Sane was immediately inserted into the match after winning the 2017 inaugural Mae Young Classic Tournament, so that kind of made sense, too. It was way too early for her to win the championship. She just won the belt for the first time a few months ago at TakeOver Brooklyn 4 um, in August of this year, so I'm glad they waited and didn't rush into it because... No one really knew anything about her. I think people liked her and they knew she was a great wrestler, but they didn't really have any real reason to give a shit about her journey for the championship. Nikki Cross winning the belt would have been cool, but at the end of the day, she really kind of had her shots against Asuka earlier on in the year. She lost, as did Ember Moon, but I think Ember Moon, it was all about destiny. It really made sense for her to come out on top here and um, finally become the champion, which she did. And then Peyton Royce... It would have been a cool wild card thing for her to win the title. I think people were hoping for her to win the championship just because she had gotten so many shots before and she'd been a good worker. Eh, I don't know. Peyton Royce is the NXT Women's Champion. We'll never know how it would have gone because it didn't happen. But just seeing as, seeing as how she's booked now on SmackDown, I don't really think it would have done anything for the title for Peyton Royce to be the champion. Now, obviously, Ember would hold the gold until facing Shayna Baszler and dropping it to Shayna Baszler at TakeOver New Orleans in April of this year. So if Royce was champion, eh, it doesn't really do much for me. There's really not many opponents for her to face um, that would have been exciting coming out of the show. So I'm glad Ember Moon mer emerged victorious. It was not the strongest women's match I've ever seen on a takeover by, uh, on a takeover by far. They all worked well together. It was a very fun fatal four-way. Um, it had a nice pace. Again, a bit of an unpredictable finish. Any one of these women could have walked out as the new champion. I was glad it was Ember Moon, though. Um, but still, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad they slotted it third on the card and not fourth or fifth. I mean, obviously not the main event, but like not as the co-main event, which they've done in the past, which is great because the women usually steal the show on these takeovers, but this was far from the best match. If anything, I would rank the matches, I would rank this fourth. I would rank this above Sullivan and Ono, of course. 
But behind Black and Dream, Almas and McIntyre, and even the War Games main event, it was a really good match, but not nearly as good as the other matches on the show for the most part. And plus, we had seen a few other multi-women championship matches before on these takeovers. We had a three-way in Chicago. They had a four-way, I believe. Yeah, four-way. They had a four-way in San Antonio back in January. We've seen so many fucking multi-women matches that by this point, it had just grown old. But they still delivered, had a good match with the right outcome. Ember Moon, the new NXT Women's Champion, being congratulated and given the title afterward by the one and only Asuka, her familiar foe from many months earlier, Asuka finally showing Ember Moon her respect, the respect that she deserved. It was kind of a fuck you to Ember Moon. It's like, hey, you couldn't beat me for this championship, but you can win it now. Congrats, now that I'm no longer here. I kind of got that vibe from it, but I'm hoping they do clash at some point down the road, too, and on the main roster. I think that can still be a money feud if uh, if built up the right way. And I think people want to see it, too. People react with very loud NXT chants when they collided in the first ever Women's Royal Rumble earlier this year. Um, there were a lot of loud NXT chants when they went face-to-face in the most recent Evolution Battle Royal, um, just a few short weeks ago. So I think people do want to see Moon and Asuka again, knowing how good of matches they had in 2017. The TakeOver, um, both of which I talked about here on the show, but the TakeOver Orlando match was pretty good. The Brooklyn match was outstanding. So the third match, if and when it does happen in the main roster, should be equally exceptional. But this was a good match, though. For the NXT Championship, we had Drew McIntyre defending against Andrade San Almas. Um, this was an excellent match. And the thing with Almas is that he was kind of... It felt like he had been built up as a threat to the championship fairly quickly. Now, he had been going... He had, hey, he had embarked on an undefeated streak. So what really happened here? Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Not when, to, when Almas debuted, but kind of sort of. I mean, he debuted with some fanfare. It fizzled out very quickly. Went on to do nothing for the remainder of 2016. He turned heel. You know, that was good. He had a couple good matches with Black and with um, Roderick Strong and a few others. But he was lost. The guy was the biggest loser in NXT. So then they finally turned the new leaf on him. They paired him with Zelina Vega, the former um, Rosita from TNA. And they hit it off instantly. They had great chemistry from the get-go. And they've been um, amazing and amazing in the alliance ever since, even including their time on, their stint on SmackDown, even dating back, you know, dating to up until today, whatever. Um, Zelina Vega and Almas are such a great pairing on TV, and it worked in NXT just as well as it works on SmackDown. But anyway, with Almas and Zelina Vega, Vega was determined to get Almas back on track and lead him to the NXT Championship. And Almas, in beating Johnny Gargano in a rematch from TakeOver Brooklyn 3 on an episode of NXT TV right before TakeOver War Games, he had earned a shot at the strap, so... He was a threat. He was a threat to the championship. But as seen the takeover Brooklyn, when Adam Cole debuted, it looked like Adam Cole and Drew McIntyre was the ultimate path they were going down for the NXT championship. Now, the weird thing here is that, first of all, this match was excellent. These guys worked wonderfully together. It was a really great match. McIntyre got hurt down the stretch. Not on the finish when Andrade hit him with the, um, whatever is the Tranquilo DDT. I don't know what he calls it. The DDT off the top rope. That wasn't where he got hurt. I think he got hurt shortly before that. If not right after that, off another move, I can't recall exactly. But McIntyre got hurt. He was on the shelf for the next five months and never made another appearance in NXT, at least on TV, until showing up on Raw right after WrestleMania 34. So I'm kind of glad they did the Adam Cole-Drew McIntyre match on a house show instead. Um, They ended up showing off that match on an episode of NXT TV at the end of the year and they did the best of 2017 or whatever it was. Um, which was cool. So I'm glad, you know, everything works out for a reason. I'm not sure what the plan would have been if McIntyre didn't get hurt. And it's not like they gave almost the championship because McIntyre got hurt and it was a um, decision made on the fly. I'm sure that was not the case whatsoever. But yeah, McIntyre did not get hurt. He probably will, still would have been around. Um, lost to Almas. Maybe had the feud with Adam Cole, but like, does it even really matter if the championship's not on the line? You know what I'm saying? So... I'm glad they did the match when they did before McIntyre got hurt because he never again made another appearance on the main roster, or rather in NXT before surfacing on the main roster in April of 2018. But yeah, this match was awesome. Almas was on just a whole fucking new level here. The guy was delivering left and right. McIntyre has always been known to be a great worker, so that was no surprise. But Almas, I mean, again, his match with Gargano in Brooklyn was really something special too. Um, So the fact that this match was great was hardly a surprise. But still, they had never really clashed before this. They did have a match in an NXT house show that I attended in September of that year 
Um, it was the main event of that show for the NXT Championship, and I'm thinking, okay, almost will likely be a fun filler feud for McIntyre before it goes after Adam Cole. But no, almost won here, almost won clean, and became the new NXT Champion. A lot of suspenseful near falls. The crowd was into it. This was an awesome, awesome, awesome match with almost finally overcoming his demons and becoming the new NXT Champion. So again, I love this a lot. These guys really put forth a tremendous effort here, and it paid off exceptionally well with Andrade becoming the new NXT Champion. And then from there, just kind of rolling on and dominating the brand as the champ until dropping it at NXT TakeOver New Orleans a few short months later. So then we get to the main event, a War Games match um, pitting three teams against each other. So if you've never seen a War Games match, I mean, I don't think I had ever seen a War Games match before watching this match the first time last year, not when I watched it on replay, of course, uh, to review for this show. But um, I know how the rules worked loosely. Because most War Games matches usually pit four or five people against each other. It's usually a 10-man match or an 8-man match. This year, it's an 8-man match with two teams of four. On this show, it was three teams of three. So it was nine guys in there, which sounds like a fucking disaster of done poorly. But come on, people. It's NXT. They're not going to bring back War Games and not do right by it if, you know, they're, they're not going to bring it back and not do right by it. Let's put it that way. It's NXT. They're going to do it justice, and they did exactly that. So first of all, the three teams consisted of the Undisputed Era, that being Adam Cole, Bay Bay, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly, the Authors of Pain, and Roderick Strong. So a bit of a um, oddball tandem here, but Roderick Strong had problems with Undisputed Era, so that kind of made sense. That's why he was included here. Um, Authors of Pain had been feuding with the Undisputed Era and Sanity for a while coming out of the show. And then Sanity, um, Sanity, Alexander Wolf, Killian Dane, and Eric Young had their problems with both Undisputed Era and Authors of Pain um, coming out of TakeOver Brooklyn 3. So I love the build of this match, a lot like this year's match. This year's War Games main event feels really, really exciting, has high stakes. It feels like, you know, um, you know, it feels like a very important match. It feels like a case where all these guys do have established issues together. And their bad blood dates back months. That was the case last year. That's going to be the case this year, too. So anyway, the way this match worked was that you started out, I believe, with three people in the ring. And then every 90 seconds, I don't know what the intervals were, people were released from the cage into the two rings. So it's the War Games is obviously a cage, but it has the two rings. You can't escape. You have to win by pinfall or submission. Um, again, with the wrong people or with the wrong people in charge, I should say, the match can be a disaster. This was a lot of fun. This was everything it needed to be. It was a hardcore brawl. They had a lot of great storytelling, furthering all sorts of feuds here. Everyone had their time to shine at some point or another, including Killian Dane had a breakout performance. Adam Cole shine, picking up the win for his team by hitting his finisher on Eric Young to pick up the victory. Um, even the authors of Pain really dominant here. Really, really dominant. Roderick Strong had an awesome showing. So everything about this was just pure fucking awesomeness, and the crowd ate it all up. Um, it got a ton of time, over a half an hour, almost 36 minutes in length. Everything about this was pure perfection. And it really turned me on to the idea of them doing another one, which they are doing this year. So I'm glad this one was such a success, because it's now given us an annual event named War Games, which, I mean, if they do it going forward, I mean, I know they're doing it this year. It doesn't feel forced, though. It feels like a genuine, organic thing. I'm hoping if they continue to do it in the future that it won't feel forced. Like they're just putting random feuds together. This year, you know, these guys involved in the match have had problems for months. Like Pete Dunne has been facing the Undisputed Era since the beginning of 2018. Fucking, you know, um, Ricochet has been facing Adam Cole on and off since like New Orleans in April. So a lot of these guys have issues with each other. You know, War Raiders just showed up. They've had their problems with Undisputed Era dating back to Brooklyn. So, I mean, that's more about that show and not this one. But I'm just saying NXT has a tendency to take something and turn it into something way better than anyone thought it could be. And I thought this match was a prime example of how a War Games match, if done right, should be brought back as an even, even or at least, you know, an annual thing or a special occasion thing. Obviously, they're making it annual, but we'll see how it pays off next Saturday when they bring it back. But I thought this match alone, though, was outstanding. All nine guys had stellar showings. And it really closed the show out and on a high note with the right trio going over, that being the Undisputed Era. Sanity was good. Um, I think it was right after this that they became the new NXT Tag Team Champions. I think Undisputed Era's Fish and O'Reilly knocked off Sanity to become the NXT Tag Team Champions. 
which was cool. I think that was right after this. It might have been before, but I'm pretty sure it was right. Yeah, it was right after because it aired at the end of the year. Um, but anyway, the authors of Pain, they had a good showing here. I mean, they're an, obviously an oddball trio with Roderick Strong. So there was no real reason for them to win here aside from the Undisputed Era. There was no other outcome that made sense than Undisputed Era reigning supreme. So again, love the match. Closed out an exceptional show. I've been saying that word a lot today here on the episode, but it's the only word I can use to describe this event because that's how great it was. So again, um, all five matches served the purpose. Four of them were great. Um, you know, we had Lars Sullivan and Ono, which was exactly what it needed to be. An extended squash win for Sullivan, which helped put him on the map. The women's match was pretty good. I wouldn't go for so far as to call it great, but it was pretty good. And all four women um, held their own, had good showings. It was a fun match. They made the most of the time they were allotted, and it had the right outcome. Black and Dream, Almas and McIntyre, and the War Games main event were all in just amazing territory. Um, in terms of just being matches that you need to see in order to believe. That's how good they were. So check them out on TakeOver War Games. This whole show is well worth going out of your way to see, especially if you haven't seen this one yet. You probably should before watching War Games next weekend to help get yourself familiar with the War Games rules and how it works and the visual of it and all that other stuff. So if there's any good War Games match to start with, it's this one. That's how good this match was. So be sure to check out the match, the entire show on the WWE Network, NXT TakeOver War Games from November of 2017. So thank you guys for checking out my review of the show. Be sure to drop a comment, share the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel for more content, for more near daily content. We'll be back next Friday right here on WrestleRant with my review of the 2017 Survivor Series pay-per-view before Survivor Series that Sunday. So with all that being said, guys, have a great rest of your weekend. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.